Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I, um, Kathy and Andy are, uh, are here and are better, better able than I am, and we'll give you some of the details of these bills. Um, I want to give you some context because I really do think that it is critically important that, that when you leave here tonight, uh, that people leave uh, motivated and very active to start talking to people in their neighborhoods and, and, and start uh, going out and working on these bills. If we don't, then we're not going to make any forward progress, and it's just critically important that we do. Um, I've seen the polls. You've probably seen the polls. I, uh, I, I'm out talking to people all the time. The vast majority of the people in the public sector are on our side in the sense that they are concerned about gun violence, that they believe in, in responsible regulation of guns. These are things that the vast majority of, of people in the public believe in. These are things that the vast majority of, of gun owners believe in. But I'm here to tell you that that is not what legislators are, are hearing right now. And legislators are hearing from people in large, large numbers, and that is not what they are hearing. And if that doesn't change, then this effort is, is not going to really get out of the starting block. So it's just very important uh, that we leave here tonight and we start working. Um, Emily mentioned that, that this, this movement uh, really got started as a result of what happened in Connecticut. And I know I hope that we never, uh, again in my lifetime, in my kids' lifetime, see uh, in, in another event anything like that. But you know, the reality is that we don't really need to look to Connecticut uh, to see gun violence in our community. We have had two shootings in the last two days uh, within three miles of this church where we're sitting tonight, one of them of a, of a police officer. Uh, so our gun violence problem is very real and it's right here and it's right now and it's something that needs to get addressed. And um, I don't want to oversimplify it. You know, there are a lot of different components that, that uh, go into dealing with, with gun violence. There's a, there's a law enforcement component, uh, there's a social component, and I think actually that the state has been doing a fair amount on all those fronts. Uh, in very, very tight budget times, if you look at what the state has been investing in, uh, major new investments in early, early childhood programs for kids uh, in our public schools, the governor's proposed this year to make major new investments in child mental health services in our schools and after school programming to keep kids uh, out of trouble and give them a more nurturing environment after regular schools hour, school hours are over. We have had state police patrolling on the streets of Wilmington, not an inexpensive uh, project for the first time in years. Uh, and I'm not even trying to give you an exhaustive a list of what the efforts have been. I, I just want you to, to realize that, that I think that there is a broad recognition at the, at the state and the local level that this is not a simple problem and, and there's really an effort to try to address it in, in, the, in the way that it deserves to be addressed. And even when you're talking about the specific issue of school safety, uh, that's not simple either, and I think you've also seen at the state level a real sincere and long-term effort, long predating Connecticut, to try to look at how our schools are being protected. The governor and the legislature a year ago set in motion a five-year plan for every single school in our state to have its own individualized safety plan, and after what happened in Connecticut, they collapsed that time frame all the way down to, to two years, and there have been all kinds of proposals for things that we ought to do in our schools in terms of back doors and, and uh, panic buttons and, and metal detectors and things like that. All, some of those things may make a lot of sense for some schools. Some of those things probably don't make sense for a lot of schools, but those are things that we really want to figure out for each school, whether they make sense or not. And the state, again, at some cost, has set in motion a very accelerated process to try to do just that. So all those things are happening. And some people uh, would say that that's enough and that those efforts are really sufficient to, to deal with this gun violence problem. And, and I just don't believe that, and the governor and the attorney general don't believe that. And we don't think that you can bury your head in the sand and try to deal with the problem of gun violence without talking about guns. Uh, it just can't be done. And so we are proposing uh, what we think are some very common sense, very straightforward, very reasonable proposals to try to deal specifically with the issue of guns. Uh, and I'm going to give you the, the layman's version, and as I said, Andy and, and Kathy are far better than I am to, to, to give you some of the details, which are important, because hopefully you're going to be talking to people in your neighborhood who in turn are going to be talking to their legislators about these things. And I think it's important that when people are calling their legislators that they know what the, they know what the bills are about and that they're able to discuss them. We think that everyone should be able to agree and the polls tell us that not only do most people and most gun owners, but most NRA households agree that dangerous people should not be able to buy guns. And today they can. Uh, in the last seven years in Delaware, 3,500 times 
People who have been deemed by the federal government to be too dangerous to be allowed to purchase a weapon have walked into a gun store in Delaware and tried to buy a gun and been turned away 3,500 times in seven years that we know of. And each and every one of those people was able to turn around and legally go someplace else that was not a gun store in Delaware and buy exactly the same gun that they had walked into the gun store to try to buy. And depending upon whose statistics you use nationally, 20 to 40 percent of the gun purchases that are made in this country are made outside of gun stores. So we have got thousands of people potentially, at least hundreds in Delaware, who shouldn't be able to buy guns, who everyone agrees shouldn't be able to buy guns, who can legally today go someplace besides a gun store and buy them. All we're saying is that if you are deemed by the government to be too dangerous to buy a gun in a gun store, you shouldn't be able to go someplace else, either a gun shop or someplace else up the street that's not a, that's not a licensed gun store, and buy exactly the same gun. Uh, and that's our very first proposal, and we think that it makes absolute common sense and that everyone should be able to agree to it. We also think that police officers ought to be able to effectively investigate gun crimes. And right now, one of the biggest impediments that our police departments face when they're trying to investigate gun crimes is that when they can trace a firearm back to its owner and they go to question the owner about the gun, the gun owner says, that gun was lost six months ago. That gun was stolen a year ago. And in many cases, the investigation is stymied right there. So all that we're proposing with, with the second bill is that if you are a responsible gun owner and your gun is lost or your gun is stolen, that you should report it so that there is an effective way of making sure that we know when someone's gun is stolen or lost and when the police go to someone's house and they say the gun is lost or stolen, the police can determine if that is really a credible statement or not. So that's number two that we think that reasonable people can and should be able to agree on, that we should take reasonable steps to allow police officers to effectively investigate gun crimes that really place very little burden on responsible gun owners. If someone is a responsible gun owner and their gun is lost or stolen, they should report that it's lost or stolen. And that's number two. And number three that I'll mention, uh, we very much think that the most dangerous types of guns uh, should not be out on our streets. And one example of that is guns that have high capacity magazines, guns that, as we define it, can be, can be fired 10 times without reloading. These are the guns that we most often see, most often see in the mass shooting incidents, that the likes of which Emily just referred to. And, you know, what we're proposing is uh, don't make them in Delaware, don't sell them in Delaware. If you have one already, you keep it, you can use it to defend your house, you can use it at the firing range, and you can drive it between your house and the firing range if you're doing that in a safe way. But we don't want people traveling the streets of our state with high capacity magazines. And what we've heard back from some people is, well, the criminals will still get them. The criminals won't obey the law, the criminals will still have them, it's only the law-abiding citizens who won't. But the statistics actually tell us something else. In Virginia, they just finished a study. High capacity magazines that were found on, that were confiscated from criminals when criminals were arrested uh, between 1994 uh, and, the, and the years immediately after 2004 when the federal <coughs> high capacity magazine ban was in effect. And this is what they found. When the federal ban was put in effect in 1994, the percentage of guns that they confiscated from criminals when they arrested them that had high capacity magazines dropped in half. Cut in half the number of criminals that were walking around with, with dangerous high capacity magazines on their guns. When the federal ban expired in 2004, the number went all the way back up to what it used to be again. So the one credible study that we have of these high capacity magazine statutes shows us that it's not perfect, but to cut in half the number of criminals that are walking around with, with lethal weapons that can be shot 10 times without reloading, that is not a small thing. So that's the third thing that we're asking, is that our legislator put in, legislature put in place a reasonable bill with well thought out exemptions for people who have reasonable uses for them that's going to keep high capacity magazines out of public places where they're a danger. So um, those are the bills. And I, I just want to leave you with where I started, that it, it is really hard for me to overstate uh, how much of a deficit we have to make up. You know, the, these legislators, these, this, this discussion has been out there for a while. These legislators have been hearing about this for a while, and overwhelmingly what they are hearing uh, is from the other side of this issue. And there are some legislators who are going to be for all of these bills, and they know it now. And there are some legislators who are going to be against most of these bills, and they know it now. 
and there are a fair number of legislators who are right in between, and they're undecided, and they view it as part of their responsibility as legislators to listen to what the public is saying. And they count phone calls, and they count letters, and they listen. So it is just critically important that they hear from both sides, and right now, they are not. And I know because I get the phone calls, and I get the emails, and, and they are, and I, and I know what the real numbers are, and they're not reflected in the calls and the emails that we're getting. And you know, we listen to both sides. You know, I've gotten some emails from gun owners that have been extremely helpful and that have been very well thought out. The bill that I'm spending the most time writing is this high capacity magazine bill that I just talked about. And if you compare the way I just described it to the way that we were talking about it four or five weeks ago, it's different. And some of the changes that we made in it were a direct result of some very well thought out, very practical advice that I got from some, some gun owners who contacted me by email and pointed out some concerns about it. So we are listening. Um, but we just, as I said, do not believe that doing nothing uh, is an option. And these, we think, are very reasonable and very practical options that will not happen and will not come to fruition if we don't get your help. And we can't do it alone. So you know, people are getting hurt in our state, in our city, right now. And I don't know that we can, I suspect that we can't prevent every single one of them, uh, but I think also that we, we certainly could pre prevent some. And uh, it's really on us to make that happen, and, and we need your help. So I thank you for being here tonight on a cold and, and snowy night when you have many other things to do, I'm sure.